You know, it's really true, and I think we can relate to the idea that the people that you grew up with can be some of the hardest people to convince that you're really an accomplished adult. They watched you grow up. They knew you as a little child, all of the mistakes and foibles that you made, all of the mischievous things you got up to. And when you come back, all grown up and maybe even an expert in your field, they're the last people that are convinced this is actually true. And it's because it's hard for them to separate the image of your youth from who you have now become as an adult. Ironically for me, one of my most memorable experiences of this feeling came from one of my Sunday school teachers when she found out I was going to go to the seminary to be a pastor. She thought, I didn't see that coming. (laughs) And why did she think that? Well, it's because she knew me when I was an ornery, misbehaving boy in her class, pastor's kid who thought he knew everything and didn't really need to pay attention. But things change when you grow up through life experience, and God leads you down different paths. But for those who have been with you on that journey all the way, it can be difficult for them to recognize the thing that strangers see in you when you come to them as an adult. Well, in today's gospel reading, Jesus is having a similar experience. And in His case, He has gone off and become a famous prophet and teacher and healer, and of course, we know much more. But when he comes to his hometown, they can't see it or believe it. They just picture Jesus as the son of the carpenter, brother and son to the people they know, the little guy that they saw grow up. However, there's one point of difference in the account of this experience that we read about in Mark chapter 6 today that I want us to focus on, and that is the reaction of Jesus to this rejection, to the fact that those who, in a certain human sense, perhaps know Him better than many others, and yet they miss the reality and truth of who He is. Now, in order to pick up on this key element of today's text, we need to see how it's divided into two main parts. The first part is verses 1 through 6, and this is the account of Jesus being rejected in Nazareth, His hometown. And the second part begins when he leaves from there, and he sends out his disciples, and that's how he responds to this rejection he faces in verses 7 to 13. And we're going to start the first part. So Jesus, just fresh off of raising a little girl from the dead, which he has strictly charged no one to talk about, but despite the fact that he's been telling people over and over again, don't tell people I did this, don't tell them about me. Mark also has a massive crowd always following Jesus. So it probably stands to reason that the people in his hometown have heard about this. And maybe some of them have thought, well, that can't be our Jesus. He's a son of a carpenter. He's a tradesman. He's not some wise teacher and and, uh, spiritually authoritative healer. But here he comes to the town. And he gets there, and he starts out really many of the ways that it starts out for Jesus when he goes to towns. He's asked to teach in the synagogue because he's seen as a rabbi, and he does so. But this is where things go a little differently than they normally do. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Now, at this point, you could say, well, maybe they're just amazed. It says they're astonished, right? And we've heard many accounts similar to this where Jesus does something and the response is amazement. So maybe it would be read like this, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? But if we read on, that's not the kind of astonishment that's going on here. For they continue and they say, is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So maybe it's read a little bit more like this. Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? 
Now, if we were putting it into the language of our own context, it might read a little like this. Maybe some of this sounds familiar to you. Oh, isn't that little Jesus who used to help his dad make tables and chairs down the road from us? What gives? How could he have become a great teacher? But Jesus, how is he going to respond to this rejection, to this lack of belief that he is, in fact, who he says he is, that he is, in fact, who everybody else is saying he might be? Well, first, his response seems pretty normal. He's, he has a, a, an oft-quoted uh, saying that indicates that a prophet is not without honor, but he is in his own hometown and among his family. And you'll recall just a few chapters back, <clears throat> what was Jesus' family's reaction to the stuff he was saying? That he's crazy. That he's out of his mind. We've got to go grab Jesus before he keeps chatting away all this crazy nonsense and people start thinking we're odd. And then we get to the next verse, and the next verse really is one of those verses that when you read it, it prompts a lot of questions in your mind. And he could not do mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. You read that, Jesus couldn't do mighty works? What does that mean? Well, there's a few possible answers that people will often settle on. One is that it's because of their lack of faith. I mean, that sort of makes sense in the context of the passage. That's clearly the reaction that Jesus is getting. Oh, you're not, you know, you can't be a mighty healer and teacher of God. And this is where in modern times you may hear people say, well, you just need to believe more, or your faith isn't strong enough, or you need to pray harder. But that's really not what's going on. I mean, Jesus is God, despite the rejection He's facing at this moment, and God doesn't need anything from us to do what He needs to do. The second answer might be, well, He's rewarding faith with these miracles. And that sort of makes sense in the context of this passage and maybe some of the things we read in others where He says, go, your faith has made you well that He rewards this belief that He can heal them, this faith they have in Him with these miracles of healing. Now, this can lead to what is often referred to as the prosperity gospel, that if you're a believer in God, you're going to live a more blessed life than other people. But our epistle reading kind of blows that apart. I mean, who is more faithful than Paul? who endures more for the sake of Christ than Paul, and he's got this thorn in his flesh that's bothering him, and he asks God to heal him, and he says no. Well, that doesn't seem to fit then if miracles are rewards of faith. Certainly, Paul should get a reward for his faith. So, that's not really what's going on here. Ironically, what's going on here is that God is being merciful in withholding miracles from those who don't believe. He already has a hard enough time from those who do believe that He may be who He says He is, to not get hung up on the miracles of healing that He does, and they not see why He's really here. There's a reason that the text begins when Jesus comes to His hometown with the Word, that He goes to the synagogue to teach to exposit God's Word for the people in his hometown, just as he does in all the places that he visits. For that is why he has come, to reveal the truth of God's Word, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven coming in Jesus. So what is he going to do? What is he going to do? Well, let's pull back a bit, take a, a little higher view of what's going on here. See, Jesus has been going around and teaching the good news of the kingdom and healing people. He's amassed a big following. The the crowds are pressing in. And He keeps telling people not to tell other people about what He's doing, but that doesn't seem to be diminishing the people that are trying to get to Him. So things seem to be going well, right? If we're thinking about modern ministry standards, that would be like I show up at Ascension, 
I heal a few people, bada bing, bada boom, and we've got 300 people in church in a matter of four weeks. Like, all right, something's going good, right? And then he gets to his hometown where he grew up, and they reject him. That would hurt, right? Your hometown is where you think you can come back to a bunch of people who love you and know you, and instead, they reject Him. Can you, be, can you imagine being rejected by all the people who you think know you best? His family thinks he's a lunatic. He's dishonored by everyone in his hometown. We don't need much of an imagination to figure out how we would respond to such a thing. We would get angry. We often do. We would think, I'll show you, I'm going to prove to you that I am a grown-up, that I am an expert in the thing that you think I'm not. We get bitter and petty. But what about Jesus? What does He do? Now, if that context isn't enough, remember that Jesus, in the big picture, is on a mission to give the gracious gifts of a loving God to rebellious and sinful people. It turns out not much has changed since He called Ezekiel to speak His words to His people. They're still a rebellious group that doesn't want to follow God. None of them in His hometown or anywhere deserve to hear the words of Jesus, deserve to receive the love that He has come to share with them, to teach them, to heal them, to begin to show glimpses of this freedom from the sin that has destroyed our world and our bodies and our spirits. We can easily see Jesus saying, well, good riddance, I don't have to come here. I came here out of the goodness of my heart to save you from something you don't even see, and you won't have any of it. He could have said, your will be done. See you later. I'm washing my hands of you. But that's not what Jesus does. Instead, Jesus responds with even more grace. He sends out His disciples to flood not only His hometown, but those surrounding villages with the grace of God, to implore them even more urgently to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, to demonstrate what is going to be coming in Jesus through the casting out of unclean spirits and the healing of ills and ailments. There's so much grace from God here, we can scarcely believe it. You see, we can identify with the human component as I illustrated at the beginning of my sermon today. We are the ungrateful and undeserving people who reject Jesus. We don't look for God. He must come to us, and when He does, we don't often receive Him. We know what that's like. We've experienced it ourselves in different ways when we go back to the people who know us best. But we don't really respond the way Jesus does, but I guess that's what makes Him Jesus. It's also why we need Him. Because only through the gift of His Spirit are we able to begin to even reflect this behavior in our own lives. But what is Jesus' response to our rejection of Him and our unbelief? It is to press even harder toward the goal of our salvation, to love us even more, to give us even more grace, a grace which we didn't deserve in the first place, but even more so now. What a comfort to know that when God comes to us in Jesus, He has every right to come in judgment and wrath, and yet He doesn't. He comes in grace and in mercy. If He had come in judgment, there would be no sending out of the disciples to preach repentance. The time would be done. We would have been too far gone, but yet He sends them, just as He sends us. 
But now to bring it to today, what does this have to do with you? Well, think of today. You just confessed once again the things you didn't do as you ought, that you didn't share the message of Jesus when He gave you the opportunity. Maybe you were afraid, or maybe you weren't paying attention. You were distracted by the cares of life. You thought ill of your neighbor or your spouse, and anger in your heart. You lived your life as if your own needs were the most important thing to be met. And week in and week out, you come back here, and during confession and absolution, you confess the same things over and over and over again. When are you going to learn? When are you going to fix that? That's how we respond when somebody wrongs us over and over again, when somebody rejects us. But how does Jesus respond to our rejection of Him? Even now when we ought to know better, He floods our lives with even more grace. He gives you His gracious gifts today and week in and week out, even if it's ten years in a row you've been coming and confessing the same struggle and same sin, His response is, I forgive you. His responses and His Word to remind you of the promise He made to you in your baptism. His response is, come to my table. Receive the fruits of my sacrifice, a new life, a righteousness not your own, but one that is clothing you so that when God sees you, He doesn't see a rebellious child rejecting His grace, but rather a redeemed and beloved son or daughter. But He doesn't do that just for us. Then He mirrors the very same thing He's done with His disciples in the text today. He sends us out. We are His disciples. And as His disciples, like He did, we're going to meet the rejection of the world. People may not like you because you believe in Jesus or talk about Him. In fact, Jesus pretty much guarantees that that's going to happen. And here is a great example. If it happens even to the Son of God Himself, it's certainly going to happen to you and me. Do you think that you can say the message better than Jesus can in a way that won't be rejected? But even more important for us to take away from this text is now that we have been given the new Spirit of God in Jesus, how are we supposed to respond to the rejection of the world? To be vengeful and petty? To double down and get angry at them and write them off? No. For now we know that Jesus doesn't do that to us. And He sends us out to tell others about Him through our words and our actions, and so we flood their lives with even more grace, just as our Savior has done for us, that we try even harder to bring His Word, the good news of salvation in Jesus, into their lives, whether it be members of our own family, co-workers, or neighbors, or just someone that God has brought to, to be in front of you that day. To your friends in Christ, the next time that you are sent out and you tell someone about Jesus and they reject you, remember, one, that you're in good company. They rejected Jesus as well. But also that our response is not anger or hatred, but love and grace, to seek even more just as God sought our salvation even more when we rejected Him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give You thanks and praise for sending Jesus. We're so grateful that even though we rejected Him, that we weren't even looking for Your salvation, that You continually pursued us all the way from sending Ezekiel up to Your Son, Jesus, that You sent Your love and Your grace to a wicked and rebellious people, and that in response to our rejection, You flooded us with even more grace, 
that You gave us even more of Your Word, the good news of salvation in Jesus. Be with us as You send us out. Grant us courage to speak. Give us eyes and ears to see and hear and to search for opportunities to share Your Word with others, a Word of grace and hope and life in the middle of a world of darkness and death. In the mighty and merciful name of Jesus, amen.